Thank you so much for coming, by the way. Uh, you know, I know you guys have a choice of talks, um, so <laughs> thank you for choosing to, to spend your time here. Uh, thank you also to ElixirCon for you. Thank you to our sponsors in the venue. Uh, like I said, I'm really excited to uh, be able to give this talk, uh, which is called Machine Learning with Elixir and Phoenix. And uh, this talk is uh, dedicated to my younger brother who uh, passed away unexpectedly last summer. Part zero. Uh, this is a computer talk, which means I have to start with zero. Um, so hello, uh, my name is Eric. I tend to speak very quickly, uh, especially when I'm excited and you know, talking about Elixir, talking about machine learning uh, is very exciting. So I'll try to slow it down, especially since I know uh, many of you are not native English speakers. Uh, but if you catch me going way too fast, having a hard time keeping up, just some kind of signal something, some kind of like penalty. I don't, yeah, exactly. Thank you. That would be great. Um, just to get me to calm down and, uh, and, and slow down to a, a human pace, which would be great. Um, I'm going to talk for about 35 or 40 minutes. If I come in on the lower end of that, we'll have time for some questions. Uh, if I end up using all of the 40 minutes, um, come find me after the show. We'll, uh, we'll chat. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, Nathan actually gave an excellent talk in this room just before the break, and I, I really like what he said. He said, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but not long comments sort of disguised as questions. <laughs> and I think the, uh, the same thing applies. Cool. Uh, also, today's Star Wars Day, uh, so I was obligated to include this joke. Uh, may the fourth be with you. So yes, uh, like I said, my name is uh, Eric Weinstein. I'm a senior software development lead slash engineering manager at Hulu as well as a master's student at Georgia Tech in the uh, online master's of science in computer science. I uh, recently, actually this semester, took a course called Machine Learning for Trading, which was the impetus, uh, sort of like inspiration for this talk. Most of that course is in Python, uh, so we've, I've taken uh, some translation work and uh, done you know, work in Elixir to see if it could be done. Like I said, the common wisdom is that Elixir or Erlang or Beam are not well suited to extensive number crunching, and we'll see if we can prove that to be false. Uh, you can find me on GitHub, uh, you can find me online, uh, on my website, Twitter, et cetera, in this hu human <laughs> map that I felt obligated to make. Um, I write a lot of Ruby, Python, and JavaScript, and some Go at work, uh, as well as Elixir and Clojure for my own personal projects. Um, I've been writing Clojure for about four years, and Elixir for about one. Um, I'm also a relatively new contributor to the language Idris, so if any of you are interested in uh, dependently typed programming languages or in Haskell or Idris, please, please come find me. I, I like to talk about that stuff. Uh, I also wrote this book a bit ago, uh, Ruby Wizardry. It's a, a book that teaches Ruby to uh, eight to 12 year old kids. Uh, Ruby's like Elixir, right? Somebody, somebody told me that. Um, so <laughs> if you're interested uh, in that, please, uh, please do come find me. And uh, there's a 30% discount for the duration of the conference with EuroRuby 30 from the No Starch website. So thanks also to, uh, to No Starch for, uh, for that. This is not a long talk. Uh, if you're watching the little sort of loading bar at the bottom, we're already 20% done, which is great. Um, it's 20% of the slides, not 20% of the time. Um, but I do think it's helpful to have an overview of what we'll be talking about. So we'll talk briefly about machine learning generally, uh, supervised learning in particular, neural networks in very particular, I suppose. Um, and we'll be using a bit of Python, sort of cheating a little bit, kind of setting up the, the data and the infrastructure and the ecosystem for uh, Elixir and, and Phoenix to take over. Um, I'll explain more about that in a minute. And we'll be using some publicly available financial data, and as well as Elixir, uh, and a neural network, and Phoenix. So part one, machine learning. What is it? Actually, show of hands, how many of you feel very comfortable with machine learning? Okay, good. Um, how many of you are like, I have no idea. Like, I've heard about it. I have no, no sense of how to do it, what it is. Okay, cool, good. So I was right to call this intermediate. That seemed pretty, <laughs> everyone else I imagine is somewhere in the middle, right? Um, excellent. Uh, so in a word, uh, I would say that machine learning is generalization, right? The idea that you can 
take some set of knowledge and apply it in, in one domain and apply it to another one. Uh, and the idea here is to, to help a program sort of assemble rules uh, for dealing with data so that that machine can then act independently, you know, without being explicitly programmed on new data. Uh, and sort of, I guess, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, so imagine you want to perform some kind of pattern recognition, right? Uh, you want to see if a machine can tell you if something is a picture of a car. Or you want to see, uh, you know, given a whole bunch of information about housing data all across some country, uh, what might the price of a house be in a part of the country where there's very sparse or no data? Uh, or maybe you want to say, hey, like weird stuff has been happening in my application. Uh, I'm not really sure what's causing it or what the deal is, but I would like to run a program that can tell me, mm, I'm not sure what to call this, but here are the patterns, here are the clusters of, of events. And you, the human, can take a look and interpret this for me. These are all sort of examples of, of machine learning and, and things that machine learning can do for us. Is this speed OK? Volume OK? Great. So supervised learning, the first two examples I gave of the, the car and the housing data are uh, examples of supervised learning, which is essentially learning from some labeled data. You have some set of inputs that someone, some human being likely has said, this is what they are. And we then want to construct a program that will allow us to make predictions about the unlabeled data. We have some test data that we don't really know what it is, um, and that's what we want to actually perform machine learning work on. And this generally falls into two categories. Uh, classification, where you have something like, you know, is this a car? And regression, something like, given all of these dollar amounts for houses, uh, what is the dollar amount I should expect for this house? Uh, so for the car example, you know, if we're gonna have a, a human version of it, you know, I might take you around Barcelona and say, that's a car, that's a car, that's a car, that's not a car. And then we go to Boston or Oslo or the moon and I say, okay, is that a car? And if you can successfully say, this is a car and that's not a car, with some, and as successfully, I suppose, uh, corresponds to some acceptable error, uh, then we'd say that we've generalized appropriately, right? We, we've succeeded in machine learning. Um, and the same goes with the housing data. You know, given you know, we've seen some certain, certain houses that are bungalows or duplexes, maybe they're close to good schools, maybe they're in good parts of town or bad parts of town, maybe they have more or fewer rooms, these have led us to believe or, or sort of have beliefs about the dollar amount that the house should cost, can we then generalize that uh, knowledge and use it in other domains to say, okay, this four bedroom house in Detroit, this is what it should cost, given what I know about other houses. And the labeled data are the sort of things that you know about, the, the data that you uh, are going to train on. So you sort of train your machine learning model on the, on the labeled data, and then you test it on the appropriately named testing data. And I'll, I'll come back to this, but one of the cardinal sins of machine learning is you do not get to train on the testing data. Some shops will tell you that this is okay. Uh, for example, if you constantly get new streams of testing data, like you have a real-time system and you know, over time you accumulate more and more and more testing data, you can kind of take the old test data, bake it into the training data, get even better, and then keep the, the new data aside for, for testing. And there are sort of exceptions there, but generally speaking, you're not allowed to train on the testing data it's cheating, you know, it's sort of like you, you have the rote, you've wrote memorized the, the answers rather than sort of synthesized any kind of knowledge. So our data, in this case, uh, come from Yahoo Finance, though there are several good sources. Uh, Quandl, uh, Q-U-A-N-D-L, is another good one. Uh, and these data are from the S&P 500 uh, from 2015 and 2016, which are uh, a set of stocks uh, in the U.S. stock market. It's not Truly, you'll see in the, in the URL, it's not truly the S&P 500, but rather SPY, which is an, an index that tracks the S&P 500. Um, so in this case, uh, and we'll talk in more detail about uh, indices and, and things like that in the next section when we, we get to finance, or, or finance, <laughs> as uh, folks who are very interested in finance will sometimes call it. Uh, so the idea here is to train on the 2015 data and then test our assumptions, our, our, our model on the 2016 data. Uh, I selected them because they're the most recent, but as we'll see in a bit, there are some other interesting qualities of these data sets that I, I thought made them good candidates for, for this experiment. Uh, you'll realize, though, or, or it may occur to you, that there are going to be some years in the stock market that are not necessarily good for training. Again, if the idea is to generalize, uh, if you pick a year or, or sort of a, a duration where things were really weird, <laughs> you know, were abnormal in a larger landscape of the financial market, 
maybe that's not a good thing to sort of learn about. Uh, so for example, if you took the year 2008 during the, the global financial crisis and recession, that may not be a good year to generalize from. Your machine may decide that every year is going to have a giant collapse <laughs> sometime in the middle of the year. Uh, and that's not something that, that we would want to bake into all of our models or have as an assumption in our models. So those kinds of rare events are things to think about. Um, generally speaking, when you, we'll talk more about, uh, about this, when you have a model that sort of believes the data too much, when it sort of starts to model all the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the, of the training data, uh, rather than the sort of like broad signals that are generalizable, uh, that's said to be overfitting. So when you overfit, you are kind of adhering very, very closely, hewing very closely to the data in the test, in the training data, and you're not gonna generalize well to the test. And you'll see that when you look at the error that you have in your training set as opposed to your test set. And if you're curious, the reason we have three features, we'll, we'll talk about them soon. We have very relatively few instances, only 252. So we want to try to reduce the number of features that we've got. We'll talk more about why we do that later. And there's 252 simply because there are 252 trading days per year. So those three features I mentioned. Uh, in order to do supervised learning, you need to have some features, some input values, and some labels, some output values. Uh, these technical indicators, uh, Bollinger Bands, Simple Moving Average, uh, Relative Strength Index, I'll explain more in a minute. Uh, but these are the three signals that the neural network is going to look at to determine what it thinks the price or the return is going to be. And given these inputs, uh, this is actually going to be our output, 20-day return. So the network is going to try to predict what the return on the portfolio will be 20 days from now. So if you think about the earlier discussion of classification and regression, this is a regression problem. We're looking at a real value, sort of continuous output that we're going to try to predict. You could uh, consider also a discrete problem, sort of a classification problem. Maybe you want to have your neural network say, actually, I'm not gonna try to predict 20 day return, I'm gonna try to predict just buy or sell. That's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna either return one value for buy or one value for sell, and then, then you have a classification problem. And, and neural networks can handle either one very well. Helps if I open the water bottle. So neural networks. Uh, neural networks are a machine learning tool that are modeled after biological brains. And the idea is to have many neurons, you know, functions or objects in, in the case of the code, uh, with dendrites, you know, sort of those little inward moving <laughs> branches on, on real neurons, which you can think of as vectors of, of signals and weights in the program. And an axon, that sort of long branch coming out the, the end that connects to the next neuron. And, and this is the output. Now in some neural networks, this is thresholded. In some it's not. If it's thresholded, then you kind of fire or you don't. And that's, that corresponds more to a classification problem. Uh, if you don't threshold, you can treat it more as a regression problem. You have a, a continuous real valued output that uh, you want to be the sort of prediction or the output from, from your network. So, I selected neural networks partially because they can model interactions among inputs. They have a lot of pros. Um, you know, they're relatively fast to query. Um, they can model any continuous function so long as they have two layers. Um, but part of the reason I selected them was, as mentioned earlier in the talk, they uh, are computationally expensive. And the idea here is that you sort of, you know, Erlang or Elixir or Beam are not well equipped for these kind of computationally expensive tasks. So I wanted to pick something that was particularly difficult for, for the machine to handle. Uh, there are other models that you can use for machine learning, such as decision trees, things like that, that are not necessarily quite as good for things like this. For example, they can't model interactions among inputs. Um, but as you'll, you'll hear in machine learning, there are no silver bullets and there is no free lunch. The idea being that there are machine learning models that are good for some things and others that are good for other things, lots of knobs you can turn and things you can do, but for any given well-behaved model and data set, there's gonna be some data set where your model is gonna do no better than just random selections. So there are cons to neural networks. They are notoriously finicky. They have a lot of tuning that can be done in terms of various hyperparameters, sort of learning rates and things like that. Uh, they can be very fussy and they can overfit very easily. They are also expensive to train. As I mentioned, they're computationally expensive. It takes a while. Um, you know, I, I got to the point where it was taking hours uh, with a particular learning rate or error to, to train this network, so I kind of dialed it back to try to get training to uh, 
an easier, more manageable pace. There are also black boxes, and what we mean by that is the neural network uh, is sort of like not open for you to examine. And even if you did kind of crack open the network and take a look at all the weights of the various neurons inside it, it wouldn't mean anything to you. Uh, there's no sort of explanatory power as there is with a decision tree, where if you kind of look at how a decision tree is mapped out, you say, oh, okay, the tree decided that this was the most important attribute to split on, and it's made this decision. And then this is the one that provides the most amount of information after that, and it's split here. And you can sort of trace the path of the machine's thinking by examining the, the decision tree. Uh, not the case with neural networks. They are mysteries. So if all that was a little bit uh, <laughs> vague, uh, hopefully this, this visualization will help a little bit. Uh, now this is not the actual neural network for this data set or for this uh, discussion, although it's actually pretty close. Uh, we do have three inputs, which would correspond to our three signals. Uh, there's a hidden layer. Here there's only one. Um, and there are two outputs, and if there were a single output, this would be very close to the network that we've got. Or if we had chosen to do buy or sell, as opposed to trying to predict uh, the return, again, we would uh, have a closer, we, we would hew more closely to this, this visualization. Now, the issue with overfitting, um, like I said, is, is when you sort of model the data too much and you believe it and you sort of extrapolate the, the nooks and crannies and weirdnesses of your training set onto your test set. Uh, there are ways to address this. Uh, there are things you can do, such as regularization. There are ways you can change the activation function that you use, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, that's not really a problem for us. This is a relatively simple, shallow network. But if you had a very complicated network topology, if you had many, many, many neurons or many layers, it would be tough to avoid overfitting. And so some of the things that you could do would be sort of like, you know, avoid these like very large gradients that you get or very, or very small gradients that you get as you descend through the layers or, uh, like I said, modifying your activation function. So let's talk a bit about this, this activation function and, and the way that data sort of move through the layers because I think that's key to understanding how neural networks work. Uh, so during training, the network uses uh, this, these layers of neurons and assigns them weights. So the idea is you have, you, know, you initially initialize to very small random numbers. And as training progresses, you sort of feed data through the network, it passes all the way to the end, and we get an output. And we say, okay, here's what we were expecting to get in our test data. These are our labels that we had before. And here's what we got. And then the network will say, okay, this is initially pretty far off. And so the next step is to propagate backwards. And this back propagation step effectively sort of moves the error signal back through the network and assigns to each neuron uh, a new weight based on how far off it was from the original prediction. And you do this through this kind of uh, idea of gradient descent, where if you think of the, the error you want, there's a global minimum, and you're trying to kind of step down slowly, or sometimes faster, uh, down to the bottom of this error, you want to kind of use the derivative of your activation function, the, the function that's used to determine if your network or your neuron fires or not, to control how the weights are adjusted over time. Uh, so that learning rate I mentioned is one thing that controls that sort of gradient descent. A very high learning rate means you learn faster, but it means you may kind of trip and skip over that minimum and kind of go up the other side. Uh, a slower learning rate is, makes you more likely to achieve that error minimum, but you will learn more slowly. Um, and so es essentially what happens for all of these training epochs is you kind of feed forward through the network, you look at how you did, you propagate the error signal backwards to adjust all your weights, and you do it again. And you do this over and over and over and over until you hit some threshold that you've determined ahead of time and said, good enough. This is, you know, this 95% of the time, you know, we, <laughs> we've identified cars or, you know, 80% of the time we've identified, you know, what the more or less correct price of this house is, things like that. Uh, so again, this is another thing that you can tune is this, this acceptable error that you're, uh, you're going for. So the training rules here, um, we've decided we're going to buy when we think the 20-day return is positive. We're going to sell when we believe it's going to be negative. And we're going to do nothing if it's going to be zero uh, or if it's very close to it. And I, I set an arbitrary threshold to say, mm, this is too close. Uh, we're really not going to make an investment decision based on this signal. Let's just close our position and, and, and do nothing. And so do nothing is defined as if we're not in the market, don't take a position, or if we're already long or short, we close out. Is this speed okay? Cool. Part two, finance. 
This is the <laughs> obligatory uh, warning slash caveat slash I don't get in trouble if you lose money. So I am not a financial professional. I don't have any certifications, I'm not an economist. I don't do this for work. <laughs> for work, I sit at a computer and type things and break the computer and curse a lot and then eventually things get fixed somehow because computers are magic. Um, but the, the idea here is that I'm not making any guarantee, explicit, implicit, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that this is reproducible, that this is gonna be complete or correct, that you can go and throw this at the market and that you're gonna become fabulously wealthy. <laughs> if, you, if you repeat these experiments with real money, you can and probably will lose money at some point. Uh, and that's true if you're picking stocks by hand, if you're buying index funds, if you're doing fancy <laughs> machine learning stuff, you will eventually lose money. So that's, uh, that's that. So for the, the finance side of things, there's a little bit of jargon to, to get past. Uh, so like I mentioned, the S&P 500 is a, a collection of 500 stocks. Uh, it's an American index. The actual instrument that we're following is the SPY. So that, that index that actually uh, tracks along the behavior, the performance of the, the S&P 500. Uh, adjusted close. So this is the price at the end of the day, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the United States when the uh, stock market closes and whatever that price is, that's the close for the day. Now the adjusted close is very slightly different. Um, and I'll, I'll explain it in terms of this next one, the, the stock split. Uh, companies can sometimes say, uh, my stock is too expensive, or for some reason I've decided I'm going to convert the number of, the number of shares that I have outstanding without diluting or adding new ones. So the idea might be company A has 1,000 shares outstanding, but the stock has you know, climbed and climbed and now costs $100 a share, so their market capitalization is $100,000. But they might decide, mm, what I'm gonna do to make this more affordable for people to buy shares in an age where people you know, try to buy you know, round lots of 100 shares, say. Um, what I'm going to do is say, for everyone who has one share that costs $100, those people now have two shares that cost $50 each, which is great. No one gets diluted. Everyone has the same amount of money that they had before. But if you, in, you know, maybe this happens in 2012, you in 2017 look back at the data and say, oh man, something really bad happened on that day because their stock price fell in half <laughs> in like one day. Um, you know, how did they lose 50% of their value? They performed a split. So the adjusted close accounts for things like stock splits that would make the data hard to manage otherwise. Uh, so that's adjusted close and, and those are stock splits. And this last one is look ahead bias. So look ahead bias, this is the sort of second, I guess, cardinal sin of machine learning, though it is unique to time series data. So for look ahead, the idea of this bias is that you have some bias that's introduced when you're using data that you would not have had when you're running your simulation. So you can't, for example, let's say you have 2014 and 2015, you can't uh, train on 2015 and then test on 2014, right? You can't take some data that was not available at the time and then sort of go back and, and have that, uh, you know, sort of that future knowledge baked into your test. Uh, you get results that are sort of un irrationally exuberant. You're gonna get these great results and, and you'll be like, okay, cool, I can predict the future. And it's because you sort of baked the future into your test already. So for time series data, you have to be very careful to avoid this. You cannot uh, bake any future knowledge into into your model. So let's talk a little bit more about these indicators. So I mentioned we have three of them, simple moving average, Bollinger Bands, and RSI. The Bollinger Bands actually has that little registered trademark because uh, John Bollinger trademarked this, I think, in the 1980s, which uh, is you're, it's interesting when you find out what they are because it's astounding what you can trademark. Um, so the simple moving average is simply an arithmetic moving average over some window. So if you have this kind of, you know, jagged walk of a stock, the simple moving average is this sort of smoothed out line that follows the stock but trails it by n number of days. So if you have this kind of 20 day window, you're gonna trail behind that jagged, you know, random walk, but it's gonna be smoothed out over that. And what we actually care about is the ratio of the price to the simple moving average, uh, in, in a sense, kind of looking at opportunities for, for mean regression, um, if, if that makes sense. Um, rather than the stock price or the, the SMA itself. Bollinger Bands are a similar idea. These are standard deviations above and below the simple moving average. So if you have this smoothed out curve, that's the, uh, the simple moving average, the Bollinger Bands sort of uh, are on each side of it 
following it along, kind of like, you know, like a river with a line down the middle. The idea of Bollinger Bands is you kind of want to watch for events where the price of the stock kind of punches above that upper band or falls below that lower band. And the idea here is, again, sort of a mean regression strategy. Uh, the idea is if you think it, you know, if it's punched above that upper band, it's going to come back down at some point. If it's fallen below that lower band, maybe there was a poor earnings report, maybe it was, you know, who knows what actually caused this, uh, it's going to come back up toward the mean eventually. And that's an opportunity for you to buy because the idea is you buy below the band and then it will eventually come back up. And RSI is a momentum indicator that sort of measures the speed and change of price movements. Uh, and it ranges from zero to 100. Now the tricky thing here is that these indicators are on different scales, right? Your, your simple moving average ratio, maybe it ranges, you know, you're, you're sort of interested in sort of like a 0.8 to a 1.2 sort of range. Uh, Bollinger bands may be something similar, but the, the RSI is gonna be a much larger scale. And the problem with neural networks is if you have a signal that is much larger than the others, it is going to unduly influence the network, and the network is gonna to start to believe that the RSI is way, way, way more important than the other two, which is not necessarily true. So we do have to normalize uh, all of these to the same domain, so that they sort of have an, uh, none of them has an unfair influence over the way the network makes decisions. Uh, although historically, uh, RSI, you know, the idea is you're sort of uh, overbought. If you're above 70, you should think about selling, and undersold, if you're below 30, you, think, you should think about buying, and that gets scaled down. Uh, to the domain I mentioned before, if all of that makes sense. So we have our indicators. We know roughly what their scale should be. We have all the requisite machine learning and financial know-how to, uh, to start working on this. It's on to part three, the Phoenix application. So now that we understand all these things, and we know how to write Elixir, and we know a bit about finance, we can start predicting things with our Phoenix app. Uh, I imagine, I'm just gonna do this anyway, show of hands, how many of you are not familiar with Phoenix? Okay, don't, no, don't be shy, if you're really not. That's, okay, cool, I'm, I'm not at all surprised. There's folks who um, are not familiar and I think that's, it's good to be aware of that. So cool, we'll talk about, we'll talk about Phoenix. I just didn't wanna like talk about Phoenix, like literally no hands go up, I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna tell you stuff that you already know, but that's good. So Phoenix, Phoenix is a web application framework modeled after Ruby on Rails or inspired by it in many ways um, that is written in Elixir and is used for all kinds of fantastic things and in this case for predicting stock prices. Uh, in this case we're using Elixir 1.4 and Phoenix 1.2.2 which I think are the most recent but maybe uh, next to most recent if they're not the most recent. Uh, we'll also be using D3 which is a JavaScript library for charting things and drawing pretty line graphs and things like that as well as CSV files. The CSV files are sort of what the D3 library is going to pull in to generate these charts. So I apologize that this is a little bit hard to read, um, but I will <laughs> tweet out a link to the slides later today. Um, in the talk abstracts, uh, and in my original plan, I was uh, gonna use a homegrown neural network for the, uh, for the code. But over time, uh, and this happens to all of us, I discovered that someone else had done a much better job of it than I was going to do. Um, so I use that. So um, I did want to show you the, uh, some of the neural network code that I did write. Uh, you can, if you're, if you're in the front couple rows, you might be able to see this. Uh, you have this uh, function here, synapse, that kind of creates uh, a matrix of like randomly initialized values, very small ones. As we mentioned, the synapses are sort of, or the neurons are initialized to small, small random values. Um, and then we have this training method that basically goes through and says, okay, I'm gonna take some input, which appears just a, a matrix of zeros and ones. The output we expect is uh, 0, 0, 1, 1. Uh, and we say, okay, uh, we, we set up an agent to store state. And we tell the agent, okay, tell me what the state is. We get the state, store that in our synapse. Um, we then map the sigmoid function, which is our activation function. It's kind of this smoothed kind of S shape. Um, we map that over the, the input layer. We take a look at the error and say, okay, how did we do? Subtracting the result from the output. And when we determine how much we were off by, we then take that error and multiply it by the first layer with the derivative of the sigmoid function mapped over it. Again, the derivative is sort of that back propagation step where we're kind of trying to figure out the, the steepness of the curve down to that minimum error. And then we go ahead and we, we uh, update the synapse 
Uh, you can't really see it, but there's a, a couple of matrix transpositions, a little bit of arithmetic, and then we shove that back into the, the synapse state. Uh, and in this case, we end up doing this 60,000 times. And again, it's hard to read, but if you, if you can, can read in the front few rows, uh, here you'll see uh, the values are like 0 0.009, 0 0.009, uh, I think, or actually I can read on the screen, why not? Um, and then, uh, actually I can't because it's too small. Um, and then uh, very close to 1, 0.997 and 0.99, I think 35. Uh, and then as you walk down these kind of, six, these are at, at 10,000 iteration increments, you can see that the first two values in the output layer is 0, 0, 1, 1. The first two steadily approach 0, and the last two steadily approach 1. So the, the, this is about 90 lines of Elixir. It's almost all of the uh, code that's necessary to kind of have like a, a you know, sort of toy neural network. Uh, and it's already learning, which is really cool. Uh, but like I said, I looked on hex, and there were better options. So the neural net, I think it's neural underscore net package on hex, is what's used in this project. Um, and uh, that's what uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, if you're curious, I'll, I'll put this on the, uh, in the slides as well. I may put up a gist um, in the slides. There's my website. There's a blog post that has sort of a translation of uh, some Python code into Clojure that's very similar to this. Um, I can do a post as well for, for the Elixir code. Uh, so I, <laughs> I occasionally do live demos. I've done them before. But having been to more and more conferences and having become more and more uh, paranoid <laughs> about things like Wi-Fi or audiovisual stuff or programs crashing, even though I guess I'm supposed to let them fail now. I'm still getting used to Elixir and Erlang. Um, or just the difficulty of getting out of Keynote, which I've, I've struggled with my entire adult life for some reason. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to inflict that on you while I struggle for, for 10 minutes. Um, so we'll have to make do with, with some screenshots, but I think that'll be okay. So again, I apologize for the small size, but this is what training looks like. Very similar to what you saw before. Uh, if you can read these first rows, uh, there's you know, the Bollinger Band, there's a value, RSI, there's a value. Sim uh, simple moving average is a value. Uh, and we continue to, to move down from there. There's about, like I said, 200, and, there's actually about 230 values here because the Bollinger Band, if the window is 20 days, which it is in this case, and the same for the simple moving average, it'll take 20 days for you to actually get any data. The first 20 days of the year will be kind of like not a number, uh, things like that. Um, as mentioned, in order to get all this code shaped the right way to put into the neural network. I uh, had to do some pretty extensive uh, Python magic. So apologies for having to cheat a little bit there. Uh, and the cool thing, though, at the top you can see is it's processing by elixirconf. Uh, elixirconf .eu page controller. It's the, the Phoenix application. Um, and it's a get on the root uh, route. So early on, I could just hit a route, and it would train in real time, which is amazing to me. Uh, it only took a few seconds. But as I tuned the error way down and the learning rate, uh, a little bit down to avoid skipping off the bottom of the error curve, um, it became impossible to, <laughs> to train in real time. So you have to sort of train offline um, and then uh, look at your tests in the, in the application. But it was cool to, to be able to train in real time for a little bit. So here's some of the charts from the, from the UI. Um, one interesting thing here to me, so on the, on the left here we have the uh, S&P 500 in 2015 and the S&P 500 on the right is from 2016. Uh, these years are consecutive, but they don't really look that much like each other. Um, so you see the S&P 500 on the left kind of starts off a little bit rocky, goes up, kind of moves sideways for a while, has this steep drop at the end of August, beginning of September, bounces once, falls down again in October, comes back up, and continues across. And interestingly enough, it's tough to see because of the, uh, the y-intercept there. The blue line overlapped with it, but uh, we, we don't actually land up at the end of the year. We're actually very, very slightly down. Uh, for the, you, basically, the, the entire market went sideways from, from January 1 to December 31. Uh, whereas for 2016, we start, what, like, uh, uh, SPY starts at around 195, maybe a little bit above that, let's say 200, uh, and ends at around 220. It has that kind of like dip at the beginning, and then it's a little bit jagged, but mostly up and to the right. And we actually end up about, what, up 10%. Uh, for the year 2016. So like I said earlier, I, I picked these because they're recent, but it's uh, not just because they're recent, it's because they are very different. And I wanted to see if this had an impact on sort of overfitting. Right? If I had a very different year you know, before, uh, that I trained on as opposed to tested on, what would the result be? And whether this dissimilarity would sort of avoid overfitting. So this is our portfolio value. Uh, for the out-of-sample data set, for this is the test. So the 20-day return is positive. Again, the machine wants to go long and uh, take a position, 
when the 20 day return is negative, it says, mm, nope, I'm gonna short the market. And if it's zero or very close, uh, it says, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm gonna get out. And that's no position. And you can actually see a couple no position uh, moments, those flat lines where the machine just gets out of the market entirely and says, eh, I'm good where I am. Um, which is very interesting to me. I actually don't know why it's doing that. Um, but like I said, these are black boxes, so nobody knows. Um, and the universe here is uh, SPY, so the standard uh, import is 500, uh, but the index tracking it. Uh, the positions the machine can take are long 500, short 500, or nothing, uh, and we're gonna start with 100,000 US dollars. So that's why we have the, the value of the portfolio here on the side. We're down at 100,000 is where we start, and we actually end up at 116,000. So how do we do? Uh, actually, not bad. So uh, in, S in 2015, SPY was very slightly negative. We got a negative 0.73 return. Uh, the machine got about a 3% return, which is not bad. You know, we beat the benchmark. What's, what's very interesting to me is that in 2016, even though the market returned almost 10%, uh, the machine managed to get 16%, even on two years that did not really look like each other. Um, you know, that to, that to me is pretty good. Now, it's, it's not great in the context of like how well could we have done, right? So if we look back at that chart, so this is where you sort of see the fall down, the bounce up, a couple bounces, and then we kind of go up into the right. If you look at 2016, the machine sort of like follows that trend downward for a little bit, um, and then it takes the upward turn, and it does actually look like that spike downward, it actually looks like it shorts on that spike downward, which is great. That's exactly what it should be doing. Um, and then it kind of moves sideways for a bit, and then for the last couple months of the year, it just kind of like, it looks like it, it buys and holds. It basically says, uh, I'm good. Now the best thing we could have done would have been to short immediately in January, or close to it, uh, and stay short probably until that peak in like earlier mid-April. Um, and then you could do some, some shorting, try to avoid that spike in the middle, uh, and then you just go long and you just sort of follow the market up, maybe, maybe avoid that dip on the right. Um, and the best we probably could have done is about a 31 or 32% return. So even though the market got us 10% and the machine got us 16%, we could have gotten as good as, as 30, 30 some odd percent. So things that we could change. Um, we do have a relatively simple set of technical indicators, um, really just variations on the price or the price momentum, and the investment theories really that eventually we're going to regress to the mean, right? Uh, so a richer set of indicators could potentially help us. Although more indicators would mean that we have a lot, we're gonna require a lot more data. There's this notion in machine learning of this kind of curse of dimensionality. The more indicators that you have, the more features that you're trying to use to describe what's happening, the more data you're going to need. Um, and in fact, it's much, much, much more data. It's, you know, for example, you know, if you, if you have 10 more indicators, you're gonna need, you know, 100, uh, sorry, what is it? You're gonna need 10 squared, yeah, exactly. So it's, it is exponential uh, in the amount of data that you're going to need. Um, so it's really tough if you want to have, you know, 30 indicators, you're going to need not, you're not going to need 30 times as much data, you're going to need much, much more. Uh, but we could do that. Uh, we could design a very complicated financial engine that not only takes into account, this is called technical analysis, this idea of using older, you know, um, past prices to predict future prices. Uh, we could use fundamental analysis, you know, looking at various attributes like price to earnings ratio or beta or other attributes of, of the uh, stock market capitalization, things like that. Uh, we could look at macroeconomic trends. We could plug into Twitter and see what people are saying about various companies, things like that, or about the market in general, in an attempt to have more information about what people will do um, and have a better return. So those are things that we can, we can do. We could even change the model. We don't have to use a neural network. We could use decision trees. We could use uh, random forests. We could use um, you know, ensemble methods, like a whole collection of neural networks, things like that. It gets very complicated very quickly, uh, but there's a tremendous amount that we can do. Um, we, in fact, don't even have to do supervised learning. There are other forms of learning, such as reinforcement learning, where you don't sort of learn a, policy, uh, a model, you learn a policy. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Dr. Tucker Balch, who teaches uh, machine learning for trading, uh, and David Bird at Georgia Tech, uh, recently uh, gave a talk at QuantCon in New York, where they very successfully demonstrated uh, a Q learning trader that did achieve something like 30% return uh, over the uh, out of sample window. So there's a, a lot that can be done. Cool, we're almost done. So, what did we learn? Well, a little bit about machine learning, uh, neural networks, and finance. Um, we saw that we didn't have to use neural networks, but they're cool, and I kind of exercised Erlang and Elixir and showed that it wasn't uh, a problem uh, for us in terms of number crunching. We talked a little bit about uh, other machine learning 
models. Uh, we saw all this is super doable. And honestly, the takeaway thing that you should uh, sort of, like if you don't take away anything else from this talk, I, I think the thing that's important is that library support is what we really need. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of the scaffolding on this talk is in Python. It's sort of got things into the shape they needed to be. Um, the more library support we have, things that are like NumPy, like SciPy, like Pandas, um, the richer ecosystem we can have for doing kind of machine learning type stuff uh, in Erlang or, or in Elixir uh, on the Beam. Cool. So be the change that you want to see in the community. I know I'm stealing from Gandhi a little bit here, but uh, if you do want to be able to do stuff like this purely in Elixir, um, library support is, is what we need. So contribute to existing libraries, open source things, work on projects, share your work. Um, and make this as, as fantastic as you can. Uh, this code is a little bit of work in progress. The semester is just about done, so sometime next week this will be up on GitHub. I will uh, tweet out a link to the slides today, but a link to the uh, code will be coming out probably in the next uh, week or so. Uh, in the meantime, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, quantsoftware.gatech.edu, you can get a look at how all of the work I've talked about has been implemented in Python, some uh, interesting information about the course that I've been taking, um, and about Dr. Balch and folks like that. So if you are interested in algorithmic trading or machine learning, um, that's the place to go. Uh, and with that, thanks so much for having me. Um, thank you for choosing to spend your time here. Unfortunately, I guess we are out of time for questions, but please do come find me afterwards. I'll be around. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>